Hi everybody, thank you for being here. I am going to be presenting about neurological complications of mitochondrial disease. My name is Silma Ortiz Gonzalez. I'm an attending neurologist at the Division of Neurology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm also a physician scientist working in the Center for Mitochondria and Epigenomic Medicine, or CMEM. So I have no conflicts to disclose today. And as you have heard throughout the day with our multiple um, speakers in this MITO symposium, mitochondrial disease is a multi-systemic disorder where you are going to have symptoms presenting in multiple and heterogeneous ways. The brain, though, is one of the organs that is predominantly affected. And here we, for example, see some of the most common symptoms uh, neurologically that mitochondrial disease patients may present with, such as seizures, myoclonus, ataxia, stroke, uh, and even migraines. So what research shows that mitochondrial dysfunction affects high energy organs. And although it is not entirely clear why different subpopulations of neurons, for example, are more susceptible to injury in mitochondrial disease patients, in general, when you look at different tissues, the brain is on the top five tissues in the body in terms of ATP generation and need. So this is the basis for the presumed susceptibility of the brain compared to other organs. And I like to share this slide because as uh, many neurologists in the audience will recognize, some of the symptoms of particular mitochondrial um, syndromes, in this case, this slide is specific to mitochondrial depletion symptoms, um, syndromes so, such as pogamma, which is a subset of mitochondrial disease. But you can appreciate how, in general, nonspecific in terms of a um, developmentally delayed hypotonic child uh, with seizures these may present. So if you're a neurologist in the community, you see many, many patients that may present with this combination of hypotonia, epilepsy, and developmental delay. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I want to make sure that you keep mitochondrial disease in your radar as initially the symptoms may be fairly nonspecific. It is um, interesting to note, for instance, though, that specifically for the depletion syndromes, there are other clues to the diagnosis, such as acidosis or failure to thrive, that may um, heighten your suspicion for mitochondrial disease. But you may see that, for example, the GI symptoms um, and some other symptoms may start later in, uh, in life. So the neurological symptoms may be the ones that patients first present with. So I thought I would share a case presentation of one of my patients that I met many years ago that encompasses different areas of neurology in the sense that um, the differential diagnosis is very broad. Um, so this is a previously healthy eight-year-old boy that presented to the pediatrician with a very um, unusual complaint of just um, blurry vision and being bumping into things, which, you know, it's very broad and could be many different things. Mom noticed that his eyes looked droopy and the only thing in review of systems that she noted was that he's been a little cranky and moody for the last few days, but otherwise he's been doing well. Uh, on further history and review of systems, uh, it was evident that he had a cold two weeks ago, but nothing out of the ordinary. He didn't even have a fever, um, no other headaches, nausea, vomiting, ratchets. Um, his birth history was unremarkable. He was a full term. Um, vaginal delivery without complications and his developmental history of interest is not particularly concerning so um, again this is to raise the point that you know um, the severity of the presentation could be very broad so for this particular child he walked on time there were no concern for motor delays and he was getting some supplemental services in first grade for writing uh, with occupational therapy, which we all know is very common, as well as um, some speech therapy for some articulation difficulties that were uh, very minor. The family history was unremarkable. They deny any neurological problems. There was one sibling that also received speech therapy and there was nothing else um, was particularly concerning. So the pediatrician appropriately uh, sent the child for urgent ophthalmology evaluation, noticing that there was a pretty significant decrease in acuity, um, particularly in the uh, left eye, but you no, know, both eyes were involved. The ophthalmologist noticed that there was bilateral ptosis, 
and um, more concerning, there was also horizontal vertical nystagmus. Um, there was also impairment in color vision, and on ophthalmologic um, fundoscopic exam, they appreciated optic atrophy, which was interestingly bilateral, even though the uh, symptoms in terms of visual acuity were predominantly on the left eye. So the child gets referred to the emergency room for further imaging. Uh, this is his MRI at presentation, showing a non-enhancing lesion within the central midbrain, which I will point out to you here. Um, and there is also an additional 6 millimeter non-enhancing uh, foci of abnormal signal in the midbrain tectum um, bilaterally. So at this point, the family is told that the differential diagnosis includes a glioma uh, or brain tumor, uh, although they were also concerned for inflammatory or demyelinating disease. So um, the child gets admitted for inpatient evaluation. They repeat the MRI, the oncologist do an evaluation. And at this point, um, you know, obviously the family is very distraught about the possibility that there is a brain tumor, uh, but the oncologists were not quite sure. And they suggested some further studies that included a spinal tap um, to um, look at, at his CSF. Um, and ultimately during this admission, the child is diagnosed with ADEM, which we as neurologists see very commonly, and I'm sure you've all seen it. He was starting IV steroids, which did improve his vision. He uh, gets referred to neuro-ophthalmology for follow-up, and at that point his visual acuity had recovered quite significantly um, on his right eye. His left eye had still significant visual deficits with the 20 to over 200 um, uh, visual acuity. Um, but the interesting fact was that they noticed in their exam that post steroids and post everything that had happened, they did not feel this optic atrophy was acute and it appeared on examination as a more long standing optic atrophy, which then prompted genetics um, evaluation and referral. The genetic evaluation started with the microarray, amino acids or urine organic acids, um, and the family at this point, you know, says he returned to normal and they were basically uh, back to their normal routines. Uh, six months later, though, even though the child did not have any, had any new symptoms, a follow up MRI shows progressive disease with um, increasing lesion size in the tectum and the midbrain, which at this point was interpreted as possible mitochondrial disorder. So um, this is the imaging, and if you remember um, the prior images, this is a more extensive lesion that it was um, at initial presentation, or at this point this is uh, about 10 months from the initial um, scan. So at this point is where I met him, the genetic diagnosis um, and testing ultimately found a mitochondrial DNA encoded mutation. Um, this uh, was diagnosed, um, diagnostic of liver serratory optic neuropathy, which is also known as LHON. And typically, as uh, many of you uh, may be familiar with LHON, it presents with unilateral vision loss in young adults, predominantly in males. Um, which uh, after presentation in one eye often follows with loss of vision in the other eye within a few uh, weeks to months. So this was a very atypical presentation in the sense that um, he did have the vision loss, but it had recover um, in and also because he had the brainstem lesions. So he was homoplasmic for the 11778 mutation, which was first described by uh, Dr. Wallace and is the first actual uh, mitochondrial DNA mutation to be linked to cause human disease. Um, so it, there's a lot of data about this, and um, there's a spectrum of presentation um, that some people refer to as LHON+. Plus. Um, uh, of course, it's uh, maternally inherited because it comes from the mitochondrial DNA, and upon further um, query, given that, you know, we were very surprised that there's really no family history, given that he's homoplasmic for this mutation, um, then the mom disclosed that she has a legally blind um, brother. Um, so I will quickly review the evaluation um, in the interest of going over what you may have learned as a standard of evaluation for mitochondrial disease, and I know this was covered earlier, so I'm going to be very brief about it. But um, the point I want to make is that the evaluation, um, it used to be a lot more um, 
cumbersome and rely a lot on functional studies because we did not understand the genetics quite as well as we do now. So you probably um, are familiar with muscle biopsy or um, more invasive um, test functional testing in order to assay mitochondrial function uh, in addition to blood, urine, and CSF uh, markers. Um, I would say that the 2019-2020 update is that, of course, the diagnosis is still mostly reliable, uh, relying on the medical history and exam. Um, serum markers um, are still helpful, but we are much more um, quick to proceed with more broad-scale genetic testing, um, such as you know whole exome sequencing. Um, because we are able to often obtain a diagnosis um, faster. Uh, the other point of this slide is that even if um, the, the caveat to this is that all the whole exome sequencing has been incredibly helpful in obtaining faster diagnosis for many families, if you have a high suspicion clinically of mitochondrial disease, you have to remember the concept that was covered earlier today of heteroplasmy and that there may be different mutations in, for example, um, muscle or liver that are not detectable in blood. So if you do have a high index of suspicion, we still then now proceed with functional testing um, and biopsies. So um, in terms of management, I wanted to, for this audience, emphasize uh, one of the um, um, management strategies that is particularly um, relevant to mitochondrial disease, and that is uh, mitochondrial stroke, because you know many patients with mitochondrial disease, particularly those with MILAS, which stands for mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes, and it's encoded uh, in the mitochondrial DNA, and therefore materially inherited, um, those patients are very likely to present with uh, stroke-like episodes. And the distinguishing feature on imaging, of course, is that there is not an arterial ischemic um, distribution for the involvement um, of the in the MRI or on the CT. So the evidence for arginine therapy for mitochondrial stroke comes from um, studies um, originally done in Japan with L-arginine therapy, as well f um, uh, there's a recent JAMA Neurology paper where um, our colleague Amy Goldstein was leading that effort in terms of recommendations for management. So I will direct you, especially if you're in an ER or primary care setting where you may see lots of patients with strokes coming in, that would be a helpful um, resource, but I also wanted to point out that in pediatrics, until recently, we didn't have a lot of data uh, in terms of the use of arginine for um, stroke, and uh, recently our colleagues um, Dr. Ganitsky and Dr. Fogg have published a uh, retrospective single center analysis um, with our experience at CHOP using arginine for stroke. So uh, this is um, the um, further management slide. Uh, so in terms of the um, seizures, which is one of the symptoms that many of your patients with mitochondrial disease will experience, there's no specific data to recommend um, one anti-seizure medication over others based on a particular genetic diagnosis. The notable exception to that is um, PDH where ketogenic diet is thought to be um, center of care, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase sufficiency. Um, and other than that, um, we are still in a phase that we do not have sufficient data for each different genetic um, diagnosis in order to recommend appropriate um, seizures. So um, most epileptologists and more, most neurologists um, manage the seizures based on, you know, the EEG features, is it focal, is it generalized, and you know how medications are tolerated. In addition to that, though, it is um, particularly important for patients with mitochondrial disease to um, remain active as much as they can in terms of um, exercise, um, which has been shown by um, many people to be beneficial for um, mito disease. So especially for children that may be um, in school and receiving PTOT, that's very important to, to try to maintain. Uh, of course, the mito cocktail, which I'm sure was covered before, um, 
to try to support mitochondrial function. And I think the other um, important aspect is not only what we can do, but being aware of what we shouldn't do, such as, you know, extensive fasting. So if your patient has an MRI or a study coming up, maybe, you know, NPO guidelines that are applicable to most of your other patients, uh, we should take a pause and consider for this particular patient with mitochondrial disease, uh, use um, judgment whether that would be appropriate, uh, avoiding, for example, dehydration in the setting of a viral gastro which will be very common many children suffer from this but you know maybe a child with mitochondrial disease it will be cautious to admit them for um, IV hydration because you do not want that metabolic stressor um, um, just like with the um, hypoglycemia um, the other thought uh, for the neurologists in the audience is um, learning a little bit about what seizure medications you shouldn't do. Uh, and the big one here is Depakote if your patient has um, POLG or POLGAM, uh, because that can cause irreversible liver failure, which uh, nobody uh, wants to go through that. So um, it is not a firm contraindication or a blanket contraindication in mitochondrial disease, I should point out. Most of us are very cautious with valproic acid, but often there are patients that maybe were already um, taken by valproic acid prior to a genetic diagnosis, and that medication had worked for them, had controlled their seizures, and had not um, caused any particular side effects or alter their LFTs. And in that case, um, you can exercise caution, but you know, it, it's, it, potentially could be safe. The only firm contraindication is for POLG. Um, the other medications that I listed here um, that particularly for neurologists would be relevant will be um, topiramate or Topomax, which we use a lot also for management of headaches in addition to seizures. And that is because of if the patient is already acidotic, uh, you might exacerbate that with the Topomax, which also may exacerbate their um, risk for kidney stones. And the last antiepileptic I will mention is by Gavatrin, because there's some um, evidence about um, worsening mitochondrial depletion disorders, although again, it has been used safely for many patients with mito disease. So it's a matter of being um, cautious and aware. So um, this is the take home message in terms of um, acute stroke management, in terms of um, dosing. So based on the MILAS data again, for IV um, acute presentation, it's uh, 0.5 grams per kilo per day. Uh, for patients that have a history or, for example, a diagnosis of MILAS and a history of recurrent strokes, oral arginine um, supplementation has been shown to reduce the severity and frequency of the recurrent strokes, um, particularly in the adult MILAS population again. Um, so with that, I'm going to start wrapping up in terms of resources. Um, I put some references for um, um, stroke care guidelines. So that's the reference um, that I mentioned earlier in JAMA Neurology. There's also the Mitochondrial Disease Consensus Review, which is helpful uh, for sort of a summary of all the guidelines that are recommended by the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, um, as well as the patient care standards for primary mito disease. And those are all um, references uh, for clinicians. Uh, for families, there's also additional references, uh, UMDF, uh, the website's listed here, that's the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, uh, MitoAction, uh, and Mito Society, which is the Mito Medical Society. And with that, I will pause here and open the floor for any questions. Thank you for your attention.